this, all, all of this is San Telmo, the street fair. And then we'll uh, go to more modern part of Buenos Aires. This is the uh, Puerto Madero waterfront. And also uh, more aristocratic neighborhoods like Recoleta. Basically here we have a couple of slides of Recoleta. This is a, the entrance of a famous cemetery. And uh, this is um, Recoleta Cemetery, and um, this is where um, Evita's tomb is. Um, so from Buenos Aires, <coughs> we fly to North Patagonia. Again, let's go to the map. From Buenos Aires, we'll uh, fly it's roughly uh, an hour, 50 minute flight to Bariloche. <coughs> and let's go now through an overview of Patagonia so we understand what we are referring to when we talk about the region. Uh, the truth is that I've been asked several times what really defines the region of Patagonia, and there is nothing like a 100% accurate definition of the region. If I had to define it, I would define just as a vast region. I mean, the, the area covers more than 400,000 square miles, scarcely populated at the southernmost tip of South America. This region extends from the Pacific to the Atlantic shore, and most will agree that anything below the 41 degrees of latitude south, and basically there we, talk, we are talking about the latitude of uh, the Lake District or the latitude of Bariloche, uh, that from that south, that could be called Patagonia. Mm -hmm. The southern border of Patagonia, depending if we take the continent, would be the, the Magillian Strait, or the Beagle Channel uh, south of uh, Tierra del Fuego. Uh, when it comes to demographics, the, the weather conditions of Patagonia, uh, uh, very rough weather conditions, particularly in the past, seemed a bit harsh for human life, which explains the scarce population of the area. That and the long distances, even with uh, today modern roads, uh, driving from Buenos Aires to um, the area of Calafate and Chaten, it will take more than three days, non-stop. The, <coughs> this um, latitude, uh, 41 degrees south, corresponds with North Patagonia, also called the Lake District. This area is a superb multi-sport destination because of a milder weather milder when we compare it with South Patagonia. It shows a diversity of lakes, rivers, and forests, and really allows us to include in the itinerary even water sports as flat water kayak. Uh, okay, could we find good trekking in, in, uh, in the area as well. And basically, the area also was the center for uh, German settlement, German and Swiss settlements in, in Patagonia, so we'll find very good uh, uh, home uh, breweries and great uh, chocolaterias, great chocolate in town. So, okay. so this is the hotel that uh, will be, uh, the lodging accommodation we'll be using in Bariloche. The hotel is out, the hotel is out of town, um, the concept is that <coughs> Bariloche as a city is a, is a, is a really like a, a tourist town, but we stay away from it. I mean, we uh, fly to, into the city of Bariloche, we'll visit, of course, the breweries, chocolaterias, but then our hotel is away from a few miles away from town. From uh, Bariloche, we, we fly into South Patagonia. So now we are talking about a a latitude that we're talking roughly 50 degrees latitude south. And here we refer to like a, to a triangle, like three points. Uh, we refer to the town of Chalten, uh, the town of Calafate, that's where the airport is, and we fly into Calafate. And across the border, although it's not included in, the, in this itinerary, uh, you need to know that across the border, not too far from, he, from here, uh, is Torres del Paine National Park that uh, Mountain Travel also offers in, uh, in 
other trips. Um, the, on the other hand, South Patagonia, we, we talk about the mild weather of North Patagonia. On the other hand, South Patagonia really shows some rough weather conditions, sort of unpredictable, with strong uh, predominant winds from the Pacific that comes across the Andes um, and across huge ice fields. Basically, what we are seeing here is the Perito Moreno Glacier. We'll, we'll be talking later about the Perito Moreno Glacier. If you see this glacier, is coming down from an upper mass of ice, which is basic, which is basically at this level, where I'm pointing now. There's a huge ice field, roughly uh, 200 miles long by 70 uh, miles wide. So you can imagine the sort of weather that we get there when the winds from the Pacific comes across. Um, the region has legendary mountains. It's a superb trekking destination that has legendary mountains as Mount Fitzroy and Cerro Torre. Here we are in our way to uh, Cerro Torre. Uh, there at the end, we are seeing this is a very clear day. We were very lucky. We are seeing uh, Cerro Torre. Uh, Cerro Torre, for many, many years, was known as one of the most challenging climbs in the world. Uh, then the, there is the mountain range of, uh, well, here is Cerro Torre again. And here we are in our way to Mount Fitzroy, which is the other uh, outstanding mountain range there. Uh, an important aspect of these uh, trekking uh, conditions here is that <coughs> we'll be trekking always, always uh, at a very low altitude. Uh, and I'm talking about below uh, below 5,000 feet to 4,000 feet. So really, no altitude issues in Patagonia while trekking. Um, OK, I just want to mention a few words. OK, this is uh, when on the top of uh, our um, trek to, uh, for, for views of the Fitzroy mountain range. Um, a few words about biodiversity. Uh, I want to mention about Patagonia. Patagonia offers a huge uh, range of ecosystems. Of course, uh, most people would relate to the granite spires of mountains as the well-known image of Patagonia. But the intention when we really put together this trip, when we decided the itinerary, was to explore not just the mountains and, and glaciers, but also the desert that lies, lies east of the Andes. Uh, there we'll explore the steps, uh, for example, through, I mean, in this trekking that you're observing here, uh, we trek it through a fossilized forest. Uh, uh, we'll find dinosaur fossils here, middle of nowhere. The, this experience is well preserved as they is in, is within a private ranch, and the branch only open their gates to small groups and always with a guide from from the ranch itself. So the other aspect of this itinerary is that we want uh, authenticity in, the, in our uh, Patagonian experiences. So uh, while in uh, Perito, uh, near the area of Perito Moreno Glacier, we'll be staying, instead of staying in a, in a hotel, we'll be staying in a Estancia, which is not other than an authentic, authentic cattle ranch, at the heart of the Glaciares National Park. I, I mean, I don't know if you can observe in this picture. I mean, there are hanging glaciers near to the to the estancia. Um, these sort of experiences uh, usually bring us closer to the experience of the first pioneers that established themselves in the region. So this is the. So this is the Estancia, only a few uh, rooms at the Estancia. Um, okay. At the Estancia also, and here we are seeing at the distance, the, the, where, I mean, far away at the distance, the Perito Moreno Glacier. At the Estancia, we also have the possibility of doing a very safe and fantastic uh, horseback riding. You know, we, we go by the lake shore, we go to the surrounding hills, always walking, you know, and it's, 
clear enough. Scala frequency is on the safe. It's really on the safe side. Um, so yes, here we are at Estancia. Fantastic, fantastic place in the, as I say, in the heart of the Glaciares National Park. Okay, and then one of the glaciers uh, here, the Perito Monerno Glacier, and one of the true highlights of Patagonia. This is not the large, largest glacier that comes uh, down from the main ice field, as I pointed. So the main of the ice field is above there, and it comes 1,000 meter, well, 3,000 feet down to this level, to the level of the lake. Uh, this, each one of these glaciers, uh, for you to have an idea, has the size of a large city. This uh, glacier has the size of the city of Buenos Aires. It's huge. And basically, the particularity of this glacier is that every so many years, every four or six, depending on years, it has sort of a cycle, comes on top of this peninsula and uh, sort of creates two different lakes you know, with different pressures. Basically, uh, ice channel is open uh, underneath the glacier, and then it collapses at one. I mean, you you got to be very lucky. That's nothing we could plan. You, you need to be very lucky. But photographers from all over the world uh, wait days and days and days until the roof of this um, uh, tunnel, channel, uh, let's say, uh, collapses. So in the at the glacier, we have um, several possibilities. One possibility is uh, we can do an ice trekking. There is an age restriction for the ice trekking. The age restriction is 65 years. And they really uh, ask for your passport. So there is not, not a chance that we, we could, uh, yeah, we could, somebody that's over 65 could get into this activity. Uh, but the point is that, you know, the glacier has extensive foot bridges, and for those who don't get into the, can't get because of age restrictions, into the ice trekking, will we'll be trekking uh, right uh, in front of the glacier, you know, right in front of the, of the main wall of the glacier. As well. uh, so after uh, Perito Moreno, we come back for a uh, night to, to Buenos Aires. And basically, this is an overview of our of our trip of uh, the itinerary uh, here in, in Patagonia, Argentina. And uh, we'll wait for uh, for questions. I know that Alicia and Tania were uh, joining in. So here is the end of our uh, presentation. And we'll wait for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge, for that. Um, we just have a couple questions coming here. Um, in regards to um, temperature and footwear, uh, what what do you recommend for this trip? And um, temperature-wise, how would you recommend packing in regards to the types of jackets and pants for this trip? Uh, good. Well, I think uh, for, for all the, um, will be good for, uh, all the people that are attending this, this seminar, that we send them a gear list. But basically, what we recommend is uh, multiple layers because, uh, as I say, it's unpredictable. I mean, we can be doing water sports in North Patagonia, and we can be on a clear day and hot weather in South Patagonia as well. But then, within a few hours, um, within a few hours, we can be in cold weather. So that's the weather to expect. We really need to be, uh, not to pack a lot, but multiple layers. And um, the ice trekking, that's the only point that we'll be trekking, um, to say, on snow, on ice, given the season that we run this trip. Because basically, this is a trip that we can run uh, here in the southern hemisphere during our uh, you know, during our summer and during the shoulder season. So it will be basically from from September to April, May. So the only time that we'll be walking on ice is those um, is like an hour over the ice trekking. That's the 
maximum time will be on ice. So it's a decision if you want to be carrying snow boots, that's okay. Otherwise, uh, you, that hour will be wearing crampons, so it's not that you know will be full contact with the with the with the ice. But it's a decision if you want to carry those uh, uh, snow boots uh, with you. Other than that, we'll be trekking in on regular conditions for footwear. But uh, for what makes to the to the gear list, to the, to the clothing, I really think of uh, multiple layers. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've had a couple questions coming in about the uh, level of difficulty on the daily treks. Uh, could you shed some light on that, please? Yes, I guess um, there are a couple of um, strenuous treks towards the end of the towards the end of the trip, and we we pay special attention that those uh, strenuous uh, treks happen at the end of the trip when we plan the itinerary. So. We'll, you know, by then we'll, we have been walking in Buenos Aires. We'll be we'll walk um, moderate treks in uh, easy to moderate treks in North Patagonia. And even though for the strenuous, I will say there is there are two trekkings in in, in Chaten. One is uh, called to, to the Cerro Torre uh, and uh, Torre Glacier and Lake. That I would say is a moderate trek. It's a, it's a round round time will be six hours from Chalten back, uh, and that would be considered as a moderate uh, to moderate class. And then there is another trek that's the the one to uh, Lake of the Three to Lago de los Tres, which is at the at the bottom of uh, Fitzroy. Uh, we have several segments for that trekking, but with a perfect day, with clear day, of course, we'll get, uh, we'll try to reach the the upper segment of that, and that can be considered as a strenuous trekking. And I will say it's like uh, basically uh, eight hour uh, trekking, eight to ten hour, depending on weather conditions, but usually eight hour trekking with. Um, I'm good in meters, but with feet, let's see, uh, so it would be like 1,500 meters, 1,500 uh, feet elevation, uh, 15 to 17, 15 to 1,700 feet elevation. Okay, great. And um, we just had a question come in about possible wildlife sightings. Um, what type of wildlife uh, will the guests be seeing on this trip? Yes. Well, uh, what you find in, uh, I mean, I would say, in, uh, I, what you find along the Andes uh, will have the possibility of spotting um, condors. Uh, Condors usually, and because because they feed themselves in the valleys, so sometimes we see them as we are at the foothills of the Andes. Yeah? Of course, uh, we need to be lucky, but sometimes, and they are very curious animals. So if they are around, chances are that they will they will come, you know, they'll uh, approach to where we will be walking. Um, uh, there are mountain lions uh, in the area. There is plenty of mountain lions here in the area, but it's it's really hard to spot them. I mean, through the years, I, I, I fought four or five, but through many, many, many years of walking in the Andes, there are foxes. Uh, there are uh, guanacos. The guanacos is one of the four camelids. So from the, fami from the family of the camels, to say, the, the South American camelids, uh, there is the guanaco, the vicuña, the alpaca, and the llama. But at this latitude, will uh, we have chances of spotting uh, guanacos. Uh, so basically, that's and um, um, like there is um, yandu, which is a sort of um, um, South American ostrich. Okay, great. Um, we had a question about the weather at this time of the year. Uh, could you delve into that a little bit? Uh, what what can guests expect weather-wise? At this time of the year, yes, yes, I would say you can expect the best uh, 
possible condition, conditions at this time of the year. Uh, of course, as I said, uh, you know, the predominant winds come from the Pacific. We are just on the east side of the uh, east side of the Andes. So, uh, if a storm comes, uh, and of course uh, nowadays we know when a storm comes, but you know, uh, weather can change in a, from a day to another. It can change quickly. Uh, but I would say very good conditions. You know, I mean, uh, in North Patagonia we could be swimming. Uh, although the water is cold, but we could be swimming at some of the lakes and rivers. Uh, but uh, but the weather allows to do to do that. In South Patagonia, again, per, perhaps the best possible conditions, but uh, unpredictable. Really, we need to be prepared. Um, okay, and then I'll just get into some um, formalities here. Um, the minimum amount of people to run this trip is two. Um, the pricing uh, for four to seven mem for four to seven members is five thousand five hundred ninety-five dollars. Uh, with seven to fourteen members on the trip, it drops to five thousand. Oh, the 2017, excuse me, we have a little correction here. Two to three members, it is $6,295. And then for four to 14 members, it is $5,595. Um, the single supplement is $1,950. And uh, the internal airfare charge is uh, $750. Um, Please uh, contact uh, the regional specialist, Tanya Rao, in regards to the minimum age on the trip. Um, she will have a, have a screening process for that, for that type of situation, and also for booking as well. Uh, George, did you have anything to, um, to add? And, oh, we have, a, we have a question regarding a trip extension. Um, could you please let us know um, what would need to happen if certain guests would like to go to Torres del Paine uh, before or after their trip with you? Uh, yes, of course. I think from um, uh, from our end, we'll uh, facilitate uh, that, in both in terms of uh, um, if it's uh, FITs, we, even the, from the from the quote itself. And also from uh, facilitate. So usually, what happens with Torres del Paine is that you have all-inclusive uh, properties there, and some of those properties uh, they have transfers running from Calafate. Mm -hmm. So they start really early in the morning, and, and you need to count on a five-hour, uh, including customs, uh, including customs time, five-hour uh, trip from Calafate to. Or Torres del Paine, although the distance is very short, but we you need to go to, to really keep uh, do a loop there to get to Torres del Paine. And I think in a straight line is something like uh, 50 miles, so very very close. Um, of course, we will facilitate uh, from the Estancia or coming from Chalten. I think uh, we need to. It's, it's always easier when you come from Nivepo Aike. If the trip is happening in Nivepo Aike and, and you need to go to Torres del Paine, uh, there um, you know we can uh, we can set a really early morning uh, transfer so they connect with the people from Paine. Coming from Chalten, they have to do to connect with those transfers. They have to do an overnight in Calafate. Okay, understood. Um, we had a question uh, regarding the names of the hotels that the guests will be staying at. Uh, could you run through those really quickly? Yes. See, uh, so in Buenos Aires, we is, is, is Buenos Aires Grand, which um, we basically picked that hotel because of the location. It's a great location in a Recoleta neighborhood. Um, in uh, in Patagonia Norte, in the Lake District, we will be using Aldebaran. It's a boutique hotel, Aldebaran. Then, uh, in in uh, the area of Perito Moreno, 
uh, we won't be staying in Calafate town, we'll be staying at the Estancia, at the branch. The, the name of the Estancia is Nibepo, N-I-B-E-P-O-I-K-E, A-I-K-E, Nibepo Aike Estancia, which is a, a, a true, a true um, Estancia, a true working branch. And then in, uh, in Chalten, we'll, we'll be staying at uh, Chalten Suites, which is located um, really in, in the center of the town, Chalten Suites. Okay, and we had another question uh, regarding the dress code in Buenos Aires. Obviously, this is a hiking trip. Um, some people were wondering uh, what types of clothes they should uh, bring for that situation. For, for Buenos Aires? Yes. Casual. Totally casual. Um, even uh, some people, they bring clothes for a, for a tango occasion, you know, as, uh, if they like to. Um, but when you go to those uh, milongas, um, it's, it's a casual, it's really casual coat. Some of the fanciest restaurants in Buenos Aires is uh, like an elegant, Casual, uh, nothing, nothing to to fancy away nowadays. Okay. All right, and then um, for people interested in talking to uh, Tanya Rao about this trip, um, she is available at five one zero five nine four. 6015 and her email address is Tanya Rao at mtsobeck.com that is T-A-N-Y-A-R-A-O at mtsobeck.com so M-T-S-O-B-E-K dot com uh, for more information regarding dates and availability um, we, we look forward to working with you and hopefully seeing you in Patagonia uh, George thank you very much for this uh, webinar is there anything else you'd like to add no, thanks to, to everyone that attended. Thank you very much. And uh, any questions, uh, please let us know to, to the team there of Montan Travel Sovic. And we'll be willing to, to answer right away. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Uh, do not hesitate to contact us with any questions uh, regarding details around this trip. Uh, we'll look forward to speaking with you. Have a nice day. Thank you.